to the fourth edition of No Such Thing as the News, coming to you from up the creek in Greenwich, London. My name is Dan Schreiber, and I'm sitting here with Anna Chazinski, Andrew Hunter-Murray, and James Harkin. Once again, we're here to bring you the most interesting things we found in the news of the last seven days, like the fact that was revealed by the BBC this week that as well as being the head of the Church of England and the head of the armed forces, the Queen also wanted to be the head of the George Formby Appreciation Society. <laughs> So she apparently knows all his songs and she can sing all of them with all the lyrics. Pitch perfect, yeah. That's your queen. Okay, let's begin. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with you, James Harkin. Okay, my fact this week is that the Euro 2016 trophy is named after a man who retired from refereeing after accidentally swallowing his own whistle. <laughs> Uh, he was called Henri Delaunay. Yep. He was a Frenchman. Uh, he worked at the French Football Federation. And he'd earlier played for a team in Paris. And then he became a referee. And then one day he was hit in the face with a ball. And he swallowed his whistle. <laughs> Unfortunately, he also lost two teeth. Because oh. they were quite heavy balls in those days. Uh, and then he became an administrator. And then he thought of the idea of the Euro Championships. And they named it after him. Oh, wow. Did he always speak with a slight whistle after? <laughs> <laughs> I was looking to the referees who were going to be officiating all the matches of the year 2016. They all have day jobs outside of being referees. Do they? Yeah, so on, on the, if you line them up and you were saying, uh, <laughs> here they are. Um, <laughs> which one of these men was it who sent you off? <laughs> So they all have day jobs, and their day jobs include, there are two lawyers, there's an insurance broker, there's an RE teacher, there's an ambulance driver, there's an estate agent, and an alleged multi-millionaire <laughs> who's just doing it for fun, but they don't know if he actually is. So he's like, I've got the money, I'll just do this on the side. One of the referees was voted the worst referee at the 2014 World Cup. Oh, yet wow. he's still allowed to And they're giving him one more chance. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Why, why was he so bad? Do we know? He was, he was too harsh on the rules. Because that's the hilarious thing. When you look into some of football's harshest moments uh, from referees, they are extremely harsh. I found, the, I found the earliest red card given to anyone in a match ever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Two seconds into the match. <laughs> <laughs> two seconds. Wow. Kick off. Two seconds. And what did and he do? He just kind was... of looked at the referee a bit funny. <laughs> no, it, was in, uh, it was in 2000. Uh, it was Cross Farm's Sunday League game, and it was against Taunton East Reach Wanderers. And basically what happened was the referee blew his whistle. The striker, called Lee Todd, went, fuck me, that was loud. <laughs> Two seconds. Two seconds. Um, actually, speaking of loud whistles, did you see in Whistle News this week that... <laughs> which I've just got a thing that updates automatically on my computer. Um, uh, a school's banned whistles in its playgrounds because it thinks that children might be too frightened by the sound of the noise, and now teachers have to raise their hand in the air at the end of playtime instead of blowing a whistle to get the attention of pupils, oh, apparently. <laughs> this just, I just want to give you the quote from this teacher, Pamela Connor. Uh, who said that she was going to keep her whistle in her pocket. Nonetheless, um, she said, in case her children don't spot her hand in case of an emergency, she'll keep her hand-carved whistle on her at all times. <laughs> what kind of... Wow. Teacher's a hand-carved whistle. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Um, so, exciting times in football at the moment, because all the rules have just been changed. Did you guys know this? <laughs> what? They're exciting. Um, so... It's awkward, because Andy only learnt the original rules this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the uh, the International Football Association board they've just cha they've just made 95 changes to the rules. This is so exciting. Most of them are quite dull, but uh, some of them are fun. So they've had to uh, register various things. So the referee can now award a goal if a team official stops a ball from going into a goal. So I presume if a manager just dives in front of it, that's the same. it was a goal. Also, players wearing tights have to make sure they're matching with their shorts and their teammates' tights. 
Wow. So, here is an example of a footballer wearing bad tights. <laughs> these tights are bad. Oh, yeah. If you're a footballer, don't wear these tights. I think he's got a ladder in one of them, actually, as well. So. Um, I was looking into the teams that are playing in this year's Euro 216, and um, one of the teams that's really interesting is Iceland. They love football so much. They reckon the final, if they made it to the final, that 10% of Iceland's entire population will be over for the matches. No. Yeah. 10% of Iceland's population no. will be in France watching the if football. If you're a burglar, yeah. why not go over to Iceland? <laughs> so the mascot for Euro 2016 is this guy. There we go. Yeah, okay. that's pretty much what I used to look like when I, was a <laughs> when I, when I had a penis for a nose. And he's called... <laughs> and, He's called, he's called Super Victor, okay? Well, now, the problem is, if you go on Google and search for Super Victor toy, well, this is what you get. So, Super Victor is the name of a sex toy, okay? Oh, wow. It is, a, and it's quite an extreme one as well. Um, it's, it says on the site, uh, one of the sites selling it, beware not for beginners. <laughs> <laughs> this is really interesting. Um, British fans have been told by the French government that if they are caught while they are over there um, seeing any prostitutes, that they will be sent to sex school. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think that's to make them better at it. No. I, think, <laughs> I think what they mean is they're going to give them lessons in how immoral it is and why they shouldn't be doing it. And they'll what? get a fine of 2,500 and they will have to go to sex school. Yeah, and be taught. Um, we're going to have to move on very shortly. Um, Can I give you one last piece of whistle news that just came through? <laughs> This was in the last few hours, and it's from the East Anglian Daily Times, and it's that a search is underway for a brass whistle stolen from a steam engine housed in a Suffolk museum. Uh, police are appealing for information following the theft from the Museum of East Anglian Life in Stowe Market. Uh, the whistle was taken at some point between Sunday, May the 8th, and Friday, May the 20th. <laughs> 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 Where were you? <laughs> Between. <laughs> and you just have a lineup of referees. <laughs> uh, okay, it is time to move on to fact number two, and that is Andrew Hunter Murray. My fact is that in the recent Romanian local elections, you were no longer allowed to give people free buckets to encourage them to vote for you. <laughs> Um, wow. So this is from a, a website called Romania Insider, which is great. And uh, basically they, they have just changed the rules for Romanian local elections because there were a lot of free gifts being given out. And so now candidates are no longer allowed to give out branded pens, hats, mugs, watches, t-shirts, jackets, raincoats, hats, scarves, bags, umbrellas, lighters, matches, food, alcohol, cigarettes or buckets. <laughs> Well, yeah, something wow. to carry all the other stuff. <laughs> um, there's one guy uh, called Florin uh, Popescu who has just been sentenced to prison for bribing voters with grilled chicken. <laughs> and you think it sounds relatively like a minor offence. He gave out 60 tonnes of it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Just to the one guy. The one guy. <laughs> so the reason that the, uh, the Romanian elections have been mostly in the British news, at least, is that... Uh, there's been a town called uh, Draguseni, and in their election, you may have seen this, three candidates all had the same name. <laughs> they were, you could vote on the ballot paper for Vasily Chepoy, Vasily Chepoy, or Vasily Chepoy. <laughs> the incumbent mayor put his middle name on the form. And so who won? What? He won, the incumbent won, because he thought, I'll put my middle name in, um, and he won 1,200 votes, and the second guy got 100, and the third guy got 10. Uh, <laughs> um, is it a really popular name, though? It's a very popular name, oh, okay. and Chepoy, in case you were wondering, means big onions. So, <laughs> uh, so obviously it's a popular name. Of course, it's not just been Romanian elections this week, has it? It's mostly been that, James. I, I can't think of any other votes happening around the world imminently. Well, um, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, it seems, is going to be the Democratic um, candidate, yeah. uh, we think.
Yeah. And um, I read a really good article in um, USA Today, which said, what, we, what might we call Bill Clinton if Hillary becomes president? Because you can't call him first lady. Uh, and so they came up with lots of different ways. I thought they should call him first lad. Nice. <laughs> Um, but they said um, maybe first gentleman or former President Clinton because once you've been a president you're still allowed to be called president. Yeah. So actually it could be President Clinton's husband, President Clinton. <laughs> and it seems that might be the one they go for. I like really? first lad though because you could just tip X the Y off all the badges. <laughs> <laughs> very easy for someone in admin. <laughs> just, just on names very quickly, uh, very recently the candidates have been given their code name. So Hillary Clinton is actually going to inherit the one that she had while she was in the Bill Clinton administration. So she was called Evergreen. Also, um, Donald Trump has been given his code name, and the code name they've given him is Mogul. But prior to him being given it, there was a Republican debate in which the public got to ask, "What would you want your code name to be?" So uh, <laughs> Donald Trump said, "Humble." That was. <laughs> That was his one. <laughs> my, it's a master of irony. Um, this is my favourite. Rand Paul wanted his code name to be Justice Never Sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> what's the uh, what's the status of Justice Never Sleeps? <laughs> He's asleep. <laughs> it turns out American politicians have much more fun websites than British politicians. <laughs> really? You go on Hillary Clinton's website, you go to her store, and she's selling so many interesting products. <laughs> One thing she's selling is you can buy a tote bag, right? And on it, it says, uh, girls just want to have fun. Demental rights. <laughs> I like it. Really good, right? <laughs> really like that. Uh, and it's nice, there's a hyphen in the next slide. <laughs> Demental rights. <laughs> And then she also has, uh, you can buy, I haven't seen them so much in the UK, but you can buy uh, these little chilling things that go around your can of drink. So it says on the front, uh, it says HillaryClinton.com, and on the back it says, more like Chillery Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> and then underneath, am I right? Uh, speaking of candidates with fun websites, there is a candidate called John McAfee, as in McAfee virus scan. That's the same <laughs> really? guy. Yeah. Um, he's uh, standing for the Libertarian Party, and he has been, among other things, an antivirus software pioneer and an international fugitive. Um, <laughs> so his Twitter profile, it now reads, uh, technology pioneer, 2016 presidential candidate, but it used to read, eccentric millionaire and still alive. <laughs> 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 so the Libertarian Party are really interesting because they have a really important role to play in this election because we have the two least popular candidates for about 100 years both running to be president and so it's thought a lot of votes might go to the Libertarians who are the third biggest party but they are kind of riddled with slightly uh, eccentric people so they had their party conference this week or last week and uh, there's a guy called James Weeks who was running to be the Libertarian Party chairperson and he stepped up onto the stage to give his speech and then instead of giving his speech so music started playing and he started taking his clothes off <laughs> <laughs> by the time he was down to a tiny leather thong people were booing very very loudly oh. uh, then he uh, leans into the microphone and says sorry I did this for a dare I I'm out of the race now <laughs> <laughs> I have another libertarian candidate. Um, there's this guy called Vermin Supreme, uh, who was one of their candidates. Is he, is he related to Super Victor? <laughs> yes, the sex toy. Um, and he, one of his things is that he wears a Wellington boot on his head at all times. Uh, he advocates regular toothbrushing and a free pony for every American if he becomes president. And um, they have these events in America for fringe candidates, but he is the only fringe candidate who hasn't been invited back because during the 2011 event, he started glitter bombing the various other candidates. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a nice picture of him here, glitter bombing this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it when people still attempt to look dignified <laughs> whilst being glitter bombed by a guy with a boot on his head. <laughs>
Um, okay, so we're halfway through the show, and it's time to look at the stories that you've sent in to us via emails and social media. So we're starting with you, James. Okay, I got this emailed by Joss Sentiens, and it's from The Guardian. Uh, a great sunken city off the coast of Greece has been tested and found to actually be made of microbe waste. Oh. Yeah. So what they did is they saw all these structures underneath the water and they thought that's obviously a building, but then they tested it and it turns out that you have these microbes who when they respire they make this rock called dolomite. They're in circles and people thought they were columns, but actually they were on vents and so all the microbes kind of carried on like sitting around the circle and they built them up in like a little column. Wow. wow. It's really cool. God, imagine if, like, the Colosseum and everything and the Parthenon are all just piles of microwaves. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Anna? Uh, yeah, this was tweeted in by at Vonnie underscore D, and this comes from ITV News, and this is that uh, after a speeding vehicle was stopped by police in Swindon and the four occupants made a run for it, Police Constable Steve Hutton gave chase, shouting that he was a dog handler, and then he started barking. <laughs> <laughs> to his astonishment, one of the suspects gave himself up when he heard the barking and was promptly arrested. Wow. Yeah. Just now as a career as an impersonator. <laughs> Haven't they done a thing where they've started texting criminals and saying, hand yourself in, and they've gone, oh, OK. <laughs> Where was that? Um, that was Sussex Police, I think. Yeah, so they just text criminals now, and they go, sorry, I just get this. Oh, I've been busted, I'll see you later. <laughs> and they head. Okay, and Andy, have you got one? Yes, uh, this was tweeted to us by Lydia Milman Schmidt, uh, and it is that there has been a Bactrian camel born in Chicago's Lincoln Park Zoo. It's the first one born there since 1998. Weighed 81 pounds, and it has been named Alexander Camelton. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that, as well as being a great boxer, Muhammad Ali was also a great magician. Uh, however, he was also a terrible magician because, as it was against his religion to deceive, he immediately told everyone how he did the tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Just straight away. He could do over 30 card tricks. He could levitate. As soon as he was done, he was like, I'll explain how that happened. Um, so, of course, tragic news. Muhammad Ali has passed away, and his funeral was today. Nice little yeah, things are coming cool. out the, about his respect for um, every tiny bit of detail for his religion. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Um, his is the only star that is not on the floor. It's on the wall. And that was as a result of his request that he didn't want anyone to be walking over the name of the Prophet Muhammad. He, he, was multi, he had multiple interests, didn't he? This is one of the things that's so great about Muhammad Ali, I guess, is that uh, he was, you know, he was active in a lot of directions. Like, he was a poet. Yeah. He wrote some excellent poems. Um, so I particularly like the one he wrote uh, about his Rumble in the Jumble match. Rumble in the Jumble? Sale. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was... Uh, for this fight, I've wrestled with alligators, I've tussled with a whale, I've done handcuffed lightning and throw thunder in jail. I can drown the drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. So he was, he was a great I mean, literary yeah. figure. There's a theory that, uh, well, basically, uh, he wasn't very literate, and he said he, even the books he collaborated on, he hadn't read. Um, so he memorised everything, and that might be why he used so many rhymes uh, in his uh, pre-match sledging. One couplet here, which I just really like, it's been in my head for all day. Uh, Ali fights great, he has speed and endurance. If you decide to fight him, increase your insurance. <laughs> 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 There was a nice article in the um, Coventry Telegraph about him. Uh, about he, was a, he was a Coventry man, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, he did once go to Coventry. Oh, sure. And that's what they talked about. And um, he only ever went to one football match. Uh, and no, despite knowing that he was a very famous Muslim, they served him hand sandwiches at half time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, but being the polite man that he was, he just kind of took all the ham out and just ate the bread. Oh, really? Oh. But yeah, he went on a few tours of Britain, and um, one of the ones he was in the northeast, uh, and he played darts against the former world number one darts player, who has the best nickname of all the darts players I can find. He's called David Allen Evans. <laughs> <laughs> And once he was in Manchester and he was selling Oval Team. He wasn't great with kind Sorry, of Muhammad marketing. Muhammad Ali was selling Oval Team. Yeah, Ovaltine. he managed to get a sponsor of Oval Team, and he went to Tesco in uh, Stratford, and he went. There. <laughs> what is the story? I know. <laughs> so he went to Tesco in Stratford, and he was selling Oval Team, and there was thousands of people turned up, and the police had to be called to keep them away. But the police couldn't quite get it in their heads that it was because of Muhammad Ali, and the police said that um, they thought the reason there were so many people going a bit mad was some of them thought he was giving away free tins of oval tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's so annoying because you've got a way of calming down the crowds. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was very afraid of flying. So it's, it's interesting how many world tours he did. When he did the 1960s Olympics in Rome, uh, he was so afraid of flying that he would wear a parachute the entire journey. Oh, yeah. really? There is a story about him uh, when he was uh, sitting on a plane about to take off and this stewardess uh, allegedly says to him, can you put your seatbelt on? And he says, Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, Superman doesn't need a plane. <laughs> <laughs> tell that it's Superman because he puts those glasses on <laughs> and it doesn't look anything like him but actually one of the things he can do is compress his spine according to the comics he can compress his spine so he's a little bit shorter than uh, Superman Clark Kent it's just so, that nice detail isn't it yeah yeah that's why no one can tell even though he looks exactly the yeah. same yeah. 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 yeah if you lost an inch I'd have no idea <laughs> <laughs> this quite famous fight in 1976 in Tokyo against a mixed martial artist called Antonio Inoki. And it was kind of a hilarious fight because um, it was it, the rules were sort of altered specifically because this guy did martial arts and Muhammad Ali was a boxer. And so it ended up being that this guy realized the only way he could beat Ali was that he'd lay on the floor and he'd kick him, just keep kicking him really, really hard. <laughs> and he did this for round after round. He just lay on the floor. The Guardian said, like a hound trying to scratch its ass on the carpet. <laughs> just backing away from him and then lashing out. And reports afterwards said he might have to have his legs amputated because they'd been so badly kicked. Um, we need to move on. I have one last thing. It's a, so about the, uh, the Rumble in the Jungle, which is his uh, very famous fight against George Foreman in 1974. And he, he did amazing sledging, obviously out loud before a fight, but also mid-fight, when he would, whenever he got the chance, he would whisper to George Foreman, is that all you got, George? <laughs> um, and Foreman said he thought it would be a really easy fight. And then he said, by round six, I was thinking, yeah, that's about all I got. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I thought you were going to say, he said, I also have this handy toasty mix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is time for our final fact of the show, and that is Anna Chazinski. Yes, my fact this week is that fish can be trained to spit in people's faces. <laughs> this is a study that just came out this week, and it's a study into archer fish. And so what they did was, uh, it was, it was to work out if archer fish can actually recognize human faces. Um, and the way they deduced whether or not they could is, they showed the archer fish on the monitor screen above their aquaria, um, two pictures of people, and if the archer fish uh, spat at one of the people they'd shown a picture of, then they'd be fed, and so they learned that that was the one to spit at. And then they put that person, uh, who the archer fish knew would yield them food if they spat at them, they put that person, a picture of that person, in amongst 44 other faces that the archer fish had never seen, and in more than 80% of cases, the archer fish spat on the correct person. 
Uh, so wow. it could identify the face. And they even change the shape and the colour of the face sometimes, which is actually going beyond, like, my facial recognition abilities. <laughs> and the artificial was still able to identify which one was the person that they had to spit at to get them food. Archerfish, not to be confused with the Jeffrey Archerfish, which just says, <laughs> I'm the best at spitting in the world. <laughs> topical, Andy, topical. topical. I'm never going to have a chance to make a Jeffrey Archerfish show ever again in my life. <laughs> we can reinsert it into Have I Got News For You from 1996. <laughs> oh, oh God. Um, Archerfish are great. Yeah, Archerfish are amazing. They are. So what they do is they're underneath the water and they fire out um, jets of water and they can knock down insects off leaves and then they fall into the water and they can eat them. Yeah. Um, but what, I mean, that's amazing in itself. But if you think about it, like... Their eyes are underwater, and so the density of water is different than the density of air. So it's going to refract even when it goes up there. And also you've got gravity, which pulls down the water. So they have to aim somewhere that's nowhere near this insect, and they can still get it almost every yeah. time. Wow. Archerfish use tools. They use water as a tool, because the definition of a tool is that you mould it to your purpose rather than just picking something up. And they do that with water because what they do is they spit the last bit of water out faster than the first bit of water so that the last bit of water they're spitting out kind of catches up with the first bit so that by the time it's hitting the insect, then it's all hitting it at once. Yeah. And so that has the power to knock it off its leaf. Uh, on face recognition, uh, there is a new app in Russia which has been very, very popular. It launched a few months ago. It now has about half a million users. It's called Find Face. Um, you take a picture of someone on the street and then it tracks them down via the social networks that they belong to. Whoa! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Creepy. Um, but one of, the, one of the founders is a guy called Alexander Kabakov and he explained it wasn't creepy. This is exactly what he <laughs> explained. <laughs> it <was> humor. <laughs> but he did it while he was doing this. <laughs> But, um, what he said was, it also looks for similar people. So you could just upload a photo of a movie star you like or your ex and then find ten girls who look similar to her and send them messages. <laughs> You're absolutely We're, right. That's not creepy at all. <laughs> Speaking of apps and fish, there was this week a thing called Fish Hackathon, which is a competition where people invent mobile or internet things which to do with fishing. OK, and whoever does the best one wins. Uh, and the winner was Great Lake Saviour, uh, which is a real-time app which takes the temperature and flow data of the Great Lakes to work out when Asian carp will spawn, uh, because these are an invasive species and you need to know when they're going to spawn. Uh, another app, which wasn't quite as good, which did the same thing, was called Carpe Diem, <laughs> which would have been good, right? Uh, a few others that didn't quite win, uh, Fish Shazam, um, is you kind of get your phone to analyse the molecules in a fish that you buy and it tells you what species it is. That's so cool. Um, it's like you don't trust the signage. In the... <laughs> no, it's a bit, about a third yeah. of fish in America are uh, missold. Yeah. Um, so another one, Fish Pals, which was a companion app for fishermen. <laughs> Sounds right. good. Yeah. Oh, um, that's so sweet. Yeah. Is it on, if there's another fisherman on another boat? Yeah, you know where he is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe. Is I don't know. Is it, is it like Grinder for fishermen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're still 30 miles apart, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all of our facts. Just time to share with you the four facts that we didn't have time to get to during this show. We're going to start with you, Anna Chizinski. This is from The Guardian. At London's first naked restaurant, which opened this week, the staff have been asked to cover their genitals for logistical reasons. <laughs> <laughs> James? OK, mine is from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and it is that a green tree frog in Australia has been airlifted to Frog Hospital <laughs> in Cairns after being injured in a lawnmower accident. The frog, which had to be x-rayed going through airport security, is expected home next week. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice one. Uh, my fact is from Der Spiegel, and this is actually, this was tweeted to us by Maria Damchgar, 
And uh, the fact is that at an anti-immigration demo in Germany, one demonstrator turned up plus 50 counter demonstrators <laughs> and 170 policemen. You need three people for it to be legally considered a demonstration in Germany. So the counter demonstrators wandered off and the police went away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and finally, Andy. Uh, yes, mine is from the Salt Lake Tribune. It is that a suspicious package left outside a laundromat in a suburb of Salt Lake City has turned out to be empty. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and we just have time to quickly go over to Jane Hill in the studio. I'm not in the studio. I'm in the pub. <laughs> Hello, Bernard. <laughs> That's it from me, Andy, James, Anna, and those guys in the pub. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Goodbye. <laughs>